Steve and Pauline Richards discover your personal myth, Ultimate Handbook, remains the indispensable companion for clearing away complexes, aligning with your anima or animus, discovering your genomic intent, and beginning your individuation journey. We're really pleased to announce that this landmark book is now available in paperback worldwide from Amazon with a brand new chapter on the trickster function. If you're interested, you're very welcome to check out the link in the description. Thanks. Now, onto the video. For the vast majority of the time, the unconscious wants to be left alone. It has its role, and the ego is tasked with mediating adaptation to the world. However, there are times when accessing the unconscious directly is positively implicated. Usually, this is spontaneously initiated through a catabasis caused by a neurosis, but for the depth psychologist in training or in spirit, there are ways of going inside to test out our understanding of psychodynamics and to enter into dialectic with the deeper part of the psyche. This video, taken from a high-level IPSA professional training seminar hosted by Steve Richards, a depth psychologist with 43 years of frontline clinical experience, will explore exactly how to do this, consciously and deliberately. Everything spoken by me in this video, I have learned directly from my continued mentorship under Steve. Traditionally, amongst those trained in and familiar with Jungian psychology, an attempt at going into the unconscious is done so via active imagination. The typical process of how to do this is relatively simple and unstructured. The person is instructed to close their eyes, relax, and conjure up an image in their mind. Upon allowing it to take shape and become clear, the ego then interacts with it, communing with the images of people, navigating through any terrain, etc. The suggestion here is that anything explored and learned in a state of active imagination is potentially relevant for increasing consciousness of adaptation, and hence is healing. However, there are fundamental flaws with this process, and there is a far more efficacious route available. To illustrate why, let's consider the diagram on screen. This is the general structure of the ego. The center of the field of consciousness is largely synonymous with the Miller number, with its processing capacity of seven plus or minus two chunks of information. The contents of the Miller number is all we are truly conscious of at any one time. The rest of the ego is unconscious with respect to conscious perception and awareness and consists of our autobiographical self-concept, our self-reflexive identity across time. Contents of the self-concept can be booted up into the Miller number and hence its information moves from being unconscious to being within the field of conscious awareness. As a little immediate exercise, if you think back to a personal memory, recent or long ago, this is what is taking place. The Miller number is suddenly and spontaneously taken up by the contents of this memory, and focus shifts from immediate perception of the world around us. Hence, hitherto bringing this memory into one's mind, that memory, although a part of the ego, was, nonetheless, unconscious. Now, let's consider this diagram, a view of the ego from a different angle. This shows the relationship of the ego to Genean complexes, named after Pierre Janet, the original discoverer of dissociated subnuclei of consciousness. Steve and Pauline have described three discrete taxa of Genean complexes, all of which can be seen in the diagram. There are self-concept identified complexes that reside literally within the self-concept, 
and the ego passively believes they are an innate part of its core identity. Then there are the aligned complexes, which are in a state of discriminated association to the ego, and typically cause the most distress to an individual. The ego knows that they're there, but they aren't identified with. Then there are the non-aligned complexes. These reside in long-term memory, learning, and the so-called cognitive unconscious of cognitive neuroscience. As such, they are mostly inert, but they are still capable of autonomous action under the right conditions. We have lots of videos on this channel exploring complexes in much more detail, and you're very welcome to check them out. All Genean complexes originally form through a partition in the self-concept. When the Miller number is overloaded, it is completely normal for the ego to partition off a subnuclei of itself, which is capable of autonomous action. Most of these subnuclei naturally clear away on their own, but if the partition is consciously suppressed and or unconsciously repressed, then the partition can remain as a dynamic, dissociated part of the self-concept. That is, they become a complex. Complexes, in the vast majority of cases, are the active agents of neurosis, and, just like the person they reside within, are biopsychosocial. So, if we consider active imagination, then, it's clear to see what the primary issue and potential danger is. The ego has not separated from its complexes. The images of people, places and scenarios which play out in active imagination are highly likely to be, at least in part, Genean complexes, and therefore not elements of the deeper psyche, with the capacity to heal. Reifying and speaking with a complex is potentially highly dangerous, risking a triggering of extreme affect, that is, abreaction, or allowing oneself to be taken in and deceived by their contents, or bringing up past wounds for no purpose other than encouraging further identification with them. The prognosis of a neurosis is not positive if one simply remains bound to their complexes. The second problem with using this process to access the unconscious is the highly likely scenario of internal projection, a psychodynamic introduced by Steve and Pauline Richards. To understand this dynamic, consider the myth of Narcissus, the man who sees a reflection of himself in a pool of water, falls deeply in love with it, believing it to be someone different to himself, and is so entranced by it that he can never bring himself to look away. It becomes his whole, all-consuming reality. This myth is an intuition of internal projection. Essentially, the model that we implicitly have of the unconscious, what we expect or hope to find in there, is what we first see when we go inside. This is clear for anyone who has previously been pulled in by, say, pop Jungian psychology. Going inside, one is implicitly searching for a shadow, an anima, and the self. Indeed, that is what one does see when they've been trained to actively look for these things. A dark, shadowy figure, a dazzling feminine one, and a mandala all appear as if confirming the Jungian theory all along. We think what we see is something other than ourselves, a true representation of the unconscious, when, in fact, it is simply a reflection back of ourselves. That which reflects the image of ourselves, our current set of beliefs and our wider adaptation, back at ourselves, are also complexes not the dissociated Genean complexes, which are relatively superficial with respect to the deeper psyche, but instead, deep structure complexes. Like their Genean counterparts, 
deep structure complexes have also been acquired over the lifespan, but they crucially do not originate from a dissociation event in the self-concept. Instead, they are formed in the deeper part of the psyche and necessarily exist in everybody. In the diagram showing the psychodynamic activation chain, if we travel down from immediate consciousness, we pass by the three taxa of Genean complexes and arrive at deep structure complexes. Immediately beneath them are the meta instincts, then the pansepian instincts, and the genome. Thus, the deep structure complexes act as a port reeve, or a gatekeeper, between the so called personal unconscious and, in Jungian nomenclature, the collective unconscious. Although the term phylogenetic psyche, coined by Dr. Anthony Stevens, would be more appropriate to use to properly reflect its evolutionary heritage. It is important to pause here and remember that it is homeostasis which is responsible for clearing away neurosis. To access and experience homeostasis directly, we need to get beneath the domain of complexes and down into the instincts. These are directly produced by the genome, and thus are the closest we can get to experiencing the intent of the genome. That is homeostasis. Thus, the ego needs to get behind its deep structure complexes. To do this, the ego must first separate from its Genean complexes. Then it must be aware not to internally project. If it does, then the projection will be met by a return signal from a deep structure complex. And the ego will be fooled into thinking that it is truly seeing and engaging with objective instinct consciousness. So to return to active imagination, hopefully now it is very easy to see why this method of approaching the unconscious is seriously flawed. Genean complexes are reified, and internal projection is rife, if not actively encouraged through a preloaded expectation of finding a concept idea of what a shadow, anima, or self might be. There are other issues too, which primarily depend on true utilization of the anima and animus, that is, relating through genuine respect, which we've covered in other videos. But for now, hopefully the case should be clear. So what is the optimal way of entering into the unconscious? Steve and Pauline Richards have found, over decades of clinical empiricism, that hypnosis is the par excellence methodology to use. Through this, the ego is able to dissociate away from normal sensory perception, cognition, and even affect, releasing Genean complexes from their hold over it. In other words, the core of the self-concept remains intact, and it is this, instead of the complexes, which moves inwards and down towards the deeper part of the psyche. We have a handbook available on youngtoliveby.com and linked in the description, which describes the theory and practice of hypnosis, including a full protocol for engaging with this safely, effectively, and immediately. You're very welcome to check that out. So, using hypnosis, once the ego has dissociated from its Genean complexes, and enters into the unconscious, it will inevitably meet with deep structure complexes. The side the ego sees is simply a reflection back of itself. However, the ego need not be captivated by what it sees, and believe that it has entered into the domain of meta-instincts. Instead, it can signal, with respect, that it is aware that what it sees is not real and be allowed to continue on its journey. At this point, the ego will be in a very different place, marked by a very different phase state of consciousness, 
not cognition, nor affect. The phase state that marks the ego, when in the domain of meta-instincts, is instead meaning. Complexes are very, very good at making nonsense of the world, twisting the adaptation of the ego out of kilter with its instincts. But the meta-instincts have the capacity to heal, through passing to the ego an implicit calm, relaxed confidence, and deep sense of meaning about who it truly is, where it has come from, and where it is going. A true signal from the genome, beneath the noise acquired over the lifespan. Where active imagination reifies complexes and generates fantasy, apex-level hypnosis accesses the true wellspring of homeostasis. At this point, I'm going to play the response Steve Richards gave to a question posed by Foster, a brilliant IPSA student, from a recent high-level professional training seminar. How do you relate to a sense of meaning? That is, when the phase state of meaning arises in yourself or in a patient when working clinically, what do you do with it? He was aware of simply collapsing into different representational states, that is, cognition or affect, and wondered if there was a way around this, or if there were any nuances to consider in this process. As you say, the problem with meaning is that it's, it's not a cognitive state, but what happens, and I'm sure you've experienced this, is that when someone's experienced meaning, they can't hang on to that unless they make a cognitive representation of it. In other words, it will fade. The sense of meaning will fade. And the way that people normally deal with this is psychosocially. So if someone's sharing a moment with us within which meaning is generated between them, then there's, a, there's an amplification of that as a form of resonance, as if to say that if you feel this or represent meaning, and I do, then it won't somehow go. We'll both have shared that. It will go. It'll still go. But the act of wanting to share it gives it another representation, which can be referred back to in memory and therefore through cognition as being something that did happen and had a value to it that will be more ego strengthening than just not noticing meaning and of which it does not associate itself to our consciousness. So that's how people do that psychosocially. They, they go for an event and they say it was meaningful, but they can't put it into words, as you say, but there is a memory of it having occurred and something changing. Now, the way that occurs with Ericksonian style hypnosis is that the meaning isn't necessarily associated to consciousness at all. And if you think about it, that's very efficient and economical. And it's contrary also to the way that Jungians think that things should work, because they seem to think that you have to have meaning which is understood and integrated. They use that expression integrated a great deal. Whereas Erickson is contrary to that, and he would prefer that meaning occurs non-consciously, but change is brought about. And then the person is only subjectively aware of things having changed for the better and is completely satisfied with that. Uh, and their adaptation to the world improves and their symptoms go away. That's so economical. It's so homeostatic. And that kind of goes back to what we were saying uh, with Zev earlier, that dreams can do their job without us having to know what they're doing very often, probably for 99 plus point whatever uh, percent of the time most dreams do what they need to do without any conscious attention needing to be paid to them and i think erickson was the absolute master of understanding that and therefore of not using cognition too much to overly interpret an experience that would bring about homeostasis without involvement however obviously in everyday life we do go through the apperception of a sense of meaning uh, coming into associated consciousness to us reflexively. Uh, and then the, there is where I say that the, the normal psychosocial way of dealing with that is to share an experience that everybody present to some extent appears to agree with. And then it persists through memory and cognition and, and the shared bonding. So it serves the purpose of bonding people together, a shared meaning, a shared experience. 
Um, with people like us, <laughs> it's different because we do things contra naturum. As I was saying on, on the last card of five, I think it was a uh, seminar, we go where people should not go. Um, so it's a bit of a Star Trek analogy to boldly go. Yeah. Um, and you can go boldly and stupidly um, or boldly and unwisely. If we can enter into the unconscious with our ego intact, but in a state where it doesn't internally project or at, at the worst, minimally so, but can experience the unconscious as it is, that's a very unusual state. It's not a state of insanity which is when the unconscious bursts through into the ego and fractures it, like I said the other day, like a fragmentation grenade, it goes off and shatters the ego. The ego is intact. It's protected, though, because it's separated from affect, and it's also protected because it's separated from cognition, which is ego-focused, and would attempt to interpret its experiences in this new state as if it were only a cognitive experience. That's the dissociative model, but it's still an intact sense of self. So in other words, the, the, the core of the self-concept is moved consciously into relationship to the unconscious in the territory of the unconscious. That is different. And then we experience things that other modes of everyday adaptation and consciousness can't experience. And why do we do that? Well, we do it because we need to test out our own model and our own understanding and if possible get into a position where we can see what hides behind the ericksonian curtain so when milton erickson generates these uh, these changes unconsciously in someone by appealing essentially to homeostasis we don't see anything except on the surface when the person's behavior changes and they feel better but wouldn't it be good to know what's going on? And how can we know? We can only know by putting ourselves into a state where we can perceive this process going on insofar as it represents itself to us. And when that happens, it seems to be that we then get these resultant images, we get deep structure complexes, we get meta instincts, that kind of thing. So those things that are likely active all the time anyway, but unconsciously, that is to say, non-ego consciously, we are experiencing consciously without identification with them. And the return journey, when we analyze that, we, we, we can see what we've come through in order to be able to get to that state and there's a field of uh, associated complexes which are all bubbling around turbulently but we don't feel them but that we we can detect the turbulence in them because they are suddenly decontextualized because we have separated ourselves from them in a way even in a dream that you can't do and then gone into the unconscious and see how it works under natural conditions so it's a kind of psychological ethological synthesis internally as a subjective experience we are seeing the psyche in its natural environment without being distorted very odd very odd place but then on the way back then if we get or we acquire a sense of meaning which can be without affect when you're in the meta instinct it's just an experience and we incorporate the experience into the now subjective ego that's gone into the meta instincts on the way back we will create a bow wave of affect which pushes through the complexes because the complexes will want to reassociate to the ego as it moves back into its normal position that's when we can make a mistake because it can be as if the bow wave of affect is the experience that we've just had and it isn't it's a downstream effect of the return of the ego back to its normal position of association to the outside world also the complexes being what they are will try to utilize the affect that we are using or the the psyche is using homeostatically to push them out the way it will try and borrow those that energy to feed the complex so we must not attach to the affect in a way that a complex can attach to it if we do not attach to the affect the complexes cannot do it either because they are associated to the self-concept if the self-concept is passive then the complex cannot utilize what the self-concept does with that effect. If the model of the affect is it's a bow wave and it's pushing the complexes out the way, the complexes can do nothing with it. The ego then arrives back in its state of external orientation 
and it's left with a residual after image, if you like, of the affect that it's experienced and of the meaning, it then must associate that in some sense to cognition in order to be able to have the memory of what that experience was as being associated to the self-concept. So that's important, and that, that goes back to the analogue of the psychosocial confirmation we get when we share an experience of meaning with another person. But this time we're doing it with ourselves. We are sharing that by associating it to memory and to cognition, and then we need to hold that in proper relationship to ourselves so we don't just make it a theory. It was an actual experience that we had. There was meaning, and now I feel connected. Now the Panksepian instincts are ready to roll. Out we go into the world, and we can almost literally forget because we've identified with it, we've incorporated the process into the self-concept, in effect generated or augmented an already existing positive complex. And we've not felt, uh, fed the negative ones. But because the ego is adapted to orientate itself in the outside world, then that's what we must do. We must go there. So we don't hang on in the affect. We don't swim around in the complexes. We don't internally project. We act in the world. Then the signal goes back into the inside. That worked. The ego has adapted and has not tried to interpret us according to it, us in this context being the unconscious. So that we then tend to get that sense of fulfillment as if there's been an inner agreement that we've done the right things and people feel better. The difference being we've done that consciously to see, to pressure test the theory and to see if there's any advantage in doing it that way over the more Ericksonian way of dissociating the ego completely by using metaphor. Metaphor immediately links with meta instinct and then generates meaning unconsciously, which brings about change without the ego having to bother about it. So that's why Ericsson's metaphors work well. A metaphor is high bandwidth. It, it generates the impression of a vast scenario and a great deal of, of meaning coming through the solutions to various problems. That's easily received, just like um, a neurotransmitter might be received. It just, it's a lock and key. It goes into the meta instincts and releases meaning and the result of the Ericksonian language patterning and metaphor, and you get your result. But if we want to know why this works, we have to de devise the way of going in and testing it. And it also means that you can test out Jung's theories or any other psychoreductive model and see whether it stands real world observation when we go in. And what we will find is that at least initially, what we have been educated to believe in is that what, at which we, we first meet. And I think that's there as an attempt or a representation of solving the gap problem between ego consciousness and true non-conscious consciousness. Without the impression of meeting ourselves, the ego would have a great deal of difficulty in having any understanding of what it encounters on the inside. But under normal conditions, it overcompensates through internal projection. And that, of course, obscures the truth. And insofar as that doesn't disturb equilibrium um, and homeostasis too much, it's tolerated by the unconscious. But if it is something which is simply overriding the capacity of the whole system to self-regulate, it will resist that. And one of the ways it resists, resists is by using the ideas that we have generated and internally projected back at us in a malevolent form. And it's that which the Buddhists identify with as being the wrathful deity and something that you've created because of the state of your own mind. I think they're absolutely right. So the deep structure complex will reflect what we are. But at the same time, it offers the way in. And these images that the Buddhist first meets before the Buddhist accesses Bodhisattva is the same thing. It's the Port Reeve, it's the guardian to the doorway that tells us the state that we're in before we can move into that which is transcendent truly. And for me, that I would say in my model, if you like, the, my form of clinical practice would be the meta instinct. And I approach it in a similar way that the Buddhist approaches their concept of Bodhisattva. And then we can, as the Buddhists try to do, dissolve the fictions and the fantasies that have arisen because of the state of adaptation of our subjective personal self. Should that be influenced, say, by Jungian or Freudian or Manly Klein or whoever it is? Because uh, we will see that first when we have to know what to deal with or how to deal with what we are seeing. And that's a nuance. You mentioned the, the, the subtlety. That's where that comes in. 